Hello everyone and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. This week we have the pleasure of being joined by Jorge Martin, an activist with the international Marxist tendency and a writer for In Defense of Marxism. This week we're going to be talking about the conflict in Ukraine which broke out about two weeks ago at the time of recording. Since then, Western leaders and the capitalist media have been pouring forth hypocritical denunciations of Russia's actions. But what has actually been going on? What is Russia trying to achieve? And who is to blame for this mess? And most importantly, how do we respond to these events as Marxists? And how can we put an end to the horrors of war and capitalism? All of these questions will be answered in this week's episode of Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. So we're now into the, the 13th day of, uh, of, of the invasion and the war that's taken place uh, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, in the, in the first few days, um, you know, there, there, were, there were really only scraps of information uh, coming out of, um, coming out of the, the area. And it was kind of hard to sort of get a picture of what was going on. But I think that now there is a, a more clear picture now of what has taken place. And now, of course, there is, you know, uh, propaganda on both sides. You know, you look at the, the sort of the, um, the Western, you know, bourgeois media and they say things like, you know, the, the, the Russian uh, sort of... Um, you know, the, the, the Russian advances have now ground to a halt, you know. Um, so, yeah, I was just uh, curious to hear, um, you know, what has happened so far, basically? Could you, could you, um, you know, summarize um, the events as they've taken place? Yeah, this is a very important question because, as uh, someone said, Greek philosopher said once, the first casualty of war is truth. And this is what we've seen over the last two weeks in, in Ukraine. Just to give you an example, yesterday, the Pentagon issued uh, an estimate of the number of Russian soldiers who have been killed in this campaign. And they said it was between two and 4,000. But this was at, at odds with the official statements of the Ukrainian army, which said that uh, they, they'd killed 11,000 Russian soldiers. And the statements, of course, of the Russian Ministry of Defense, who said that only 500 have died. So you have to be very careful in these situations. But before we go into this, I'd like to just make clear right from the start what is the position of the of the IMT? The IMT, the International Marxist Tendency, is against this war, is against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But of course, we are against not for the same reasons that the imperialists uh, and, the, and the mass media in the West uh, are. They, they keep talking about national sovereignty and uh, international law and the rule of law and this and that. But they're completely hypocritical because, in fact, what Putin has done is exactly what they do all the time invade countries, organize military coups, uh, break up countries anytime they want. Uh, and, and now they, they raise a hue and cry over, over this just because it's someone else who's done it. Uh, we haven't heard such denunciations from Saudi Arabia's war on, on Yemen, which is a murderous uh, war. We haven't heard the same denunciations over NATO's bombing of Serbia in 1999. Uh, where, where dozens of civilians were, were killed in a 78-day in a 78 day, 78 day campaign of aerial bombardment. We haven't had the same denunciations of the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan. And, and, and today we have uh, BBC News anchors in, in Lviv, in Kiev, and reporting daily uh, for, for 25 minutes uh, about the conflict, about the invasion and, and the humanitarian impact of, of it and the disaster for, for the Ukrainian civilian population. But uh, we didn't have any, any BBC correspondent in Fallujah or in Baghdad or, or in Yemen or in Afghanistan uh, on the side of the civilian population being bombed by, by US imperialism and British imperialism. So they're completely hypocritical. And if I can just give a couple of, uh, of examples, one, one is Condoleezza Rice. The other day was on, on Fox News. And, and the, the, the presenter was asking her, so when a country invades a sovereign country, can this be considered a war crime? And Condoleezza Rice with a straight face nodded along and, and said yes. When she was, she was crucial in the, in the invasion of uh, Iraq in 2003, i.e. the invasion of one country, sovereign country, by another country, which is, which is uh, uh, by her own admission, a war crime. So she's a war criminal and she's there with a straight face. Or, or Javier Solana, who was the general secretary of NATO uh, at the time of the bombing of uh, NATO bombing of Serbia. And, and he now says that he cannot even comprehend the idea of war in Europe. 
Well, where, where, where was Serbia when it was being bombed by NATO? Was, was it in another continent? I mean, this is, is completely uh, cynical. We oppose Putin's invasion of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine because it's, uh, it's a reactionary invasion carried out for imperialist uh, interest in the defense, the national security interest of the, of the Russian capitalist. We, we're not in favor of that at all. But however, we, we, we're not going to join in the chorus of, of denunciation by Western imperialism, which is completely cynical and, and hypocritical. Now, as for what's happened so far, well, Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of uh, February. And I wouldn't pay much attention to all of this talk about Russian invasion having uh, slowed down or Russian advances having slowed down. In fact, in the last couple of days, if you look any, any, at any map that's been published even by the bourgeois media, you can see there's been very rapid advances in the north of the Russian forces towards Kyiv and uh, in the south in other directions. And, uh, and, and the situation, uh, and you also have to compare with other military campaigns, which can be similar, Let's say, for instance, the territory of Ukraine is, is bigger than the territory of Iraq, but in terms of population, it's more or less the same, about 40 million. And uh, if you think about 1991 and 2003, the two US invasions of, uh, of Iraq, well, first the, the, the bombardment, 1991, and then the invasion in, 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 in uh, 2003, you, you see that in 2003, they had this thing they called shock and awe, a, a massive campaign of aerial bombardment of all sorts of uh, targets, civilian and otherwise, they, they were not discriminating at that time, uh, to, in order to soften up, that's, that's how they call it, in order to soften up the country for, for, land, for a land invasion. And that went on for two weeks. And then after that, it took them, I can't remember, two or three weeks to reach the capital, Baghdad. Uh, um, so you think about this, Russia has not conducted a campaign, a, a two-week campaign of aerial bombardment to soften up the country before the land invasion. So and nevertheless, two weeks later, they're very close to, to taking Kiev. We don't know how long that is going gonna, is gonna to last. And so this, this is the reality on the, on the ground. Most of the newspapers, scandalously, they don't have their own assessment of the situation. They just repeat the Ministry of Defense public intelligence assessments which are probably very different from their own internal intelligence assessments. They, they're interested in telling themselves the truth, but they're not necessarily interested in telling, telling, uh, telling the public what the truth is. And we have uh, heard for, for two weeks, the Russians are losing, the Russians are losing, they didn't expect such a resistance and this and that. But uh, as a matter of fact, the Russians have been advancing and, and military, serious bourgeois military, imperialist military analysts, prior to the war, they said, the, the, the relative, the, the comparative strength of Ukrainian and Russian army means that the Russians will probably be able to take Kiev in two weeks. Well, this is more or less what we, at the point we are at, at now. They haven't taken Kiev yet, but, but, they're, but they're very close to surrounding it. So um, I think it's very difficult for, for a country like, like Ukraine with the military uh, strength that it has even after being uh, armed and, and, and supplied by, by the West to resist a big country, a big power like, um, like Russia. What the Russians did were first, the first day was destroy um, the, 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 uh, the air cap capabilities of the Ukrainian Air Force and most of the air defenses so that they could uh, advance unimpeded. I mean, when, when you think about this, this, this what, it, what it is, a 15 mile long column of tanks. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Why is it that the, the, the Ukrainian Air Force is not targeting? They're sitting ducks, right? They, they are in a traffic jam, apparently. They can't advance. They're now starting to advance, but they, they were for, for a few days. Why are they not being bombed out of existence? Because the Ukrainians can't. They are unable to do that at, at the present time. So this, this gives you a, an idea. And then, of course, on top of this, there's the cynical attitude of the West that, that, that uh, egged on uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainian government not to make any concessions to, to Russia prior to the war when, when Russia was threatening and uh, didn't make any concessions themselves, as, as we'll talk later on. 
Uh, but now they're not prepared to really help uh, uh, Ukraine. They're not prepared to implement a no-fly zone. Uh, they're not prepared to send any ground troops. So, so I mean, with friends like this, uh, you don't need uh, enemies. So this is basically the, the situation two, two weeks into, into the war. The, the Russians have mostly control of the Azov Sea coastline uniting the Donbas republics with Crimea. They're now advancing west towards the, towards the, um, the rest of the, um, of the Black Sea coast uh, with the aim of taking uh, Odessa. They're trying to come down uh, from Kharkiv and linking up with their forces near Zaporizhia, which will close off and circle the whole of the, the, the bulk of the Ukrainian army, which is in the Donbass front in the east, and prevent them from coming to, to the help of uh, the defense of, of uh, Kiev and, and all the major cities. So I will say it's not looking good for Ukraine, as was to be expected, as people could, could see beforehand. People say, well, the aim of Putin was a quick war and in 48 hours the government was going to collapse. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a military expert, but I'm guessing that when you go into a war, you have different scenarios. Eh? You have scenario A, that there's a rapid advance and the government collapses. Scenario B, that doesn't happen and therefore you do X, Y and Z. That, that's how, how it works. Uh, there might have been a calculation that th this was the original uh, possible scenario, but obviously they, they had other uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have moved 100 and whatever it is, 120,000 or 150,000 troops to the to the border. Uh, they pre were preparing for for a massive invasion, and that's what they've been doing, uh, wave after wave. And they haven't really been been stopped. They've been slowed down, maybe in some places. But it seems to me that this is this is not going well for for Ukraine. And the other thing is this: that Putin is in a position where he cannot back down. He cannot back down. He needs to win this. If he doesn't win this, from the point of view of an imperialist power, then he will be in serious trouble because he's been defeated in a military adventure and his uh, power, prestige and position in the world arena will have been severely dented with very serious potential consequences for him at home. So he can't stop and he will now deploy whatever it needs to be deployed in order to smash any resistance there is on, on Ukraine's part. And perhaps the war will become even bloodier in terms of civilian uh, casualties than it has been so far already. So just there, you mentioned that, you know, that the West has been uh, pretty intransigent towards, you know, Russia's, Russia's demands, you know, they're not, uh, you know, prepared to make any concessions, basically. So I was just uh, curious, you know, what are Russia's aims? What are Russia's demands? What are they trying to achieve? I think the, there are two levels to this uh, question. One is what Russia wants immediately in relation to Ukraine, and then is the more general uh, question of what are what are Russia's aims in relation to the West. The, the first one is fairly simple. Put, Putin has put it uh, very clearly. What they want is a uh, is a Ukraine that uh, doesn't join NATO, that has a neutral position. And in fact, if you think about this, when, when uh, Ukraine declared independence in 1991, it was in its constitution. It was going to be a neutral uh, country, not aligned with any big powers. But anyway, that's, that's, um, that's uh, the aim of uh, Putin. He said it clearly. He, doesn't, he, he wants a guarantee that Ukraine will not join NATO. The other thing that he now says is that, um, and this they've said at the, negotiating, at the negotiations that are taking place even today, they said that they want a recognition of Russian jurisdiction over Crimea, that this will not be put into question. And also now they're saying that they want clear guarantees that the two republics in the Donbas, the Donetsk Republic and the, and the Luhansk People's Republic, will, their independence will be recognized. Although I'm thinking that perhaps they are prepared to negotiate that, to use that as a bargaining chip. I'm not totally, totally sure because now that they've recognized their independence, they will probably want to keep it that way. Uh, and they've also talked about the demilitarization of uh, Ukraine, basically, which is a, an aim that they have more or less achieved. They basically destroyed the, 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 the main parts of the Ukrainian army and the denazification of Ukraine. I think that's mostly for, for propaganda purposes for putting back home. 
But yeah, they might they might demand the uh, the disbandment of some of the neo-Nazi battalions, which are now part of the Ukrainian army, things like that. But the main the main demands is that that uh, that uh, Ukraine should should have a neutral status, or they should change the constitution because the constitution was changed 2019 by the Rada, the parliament, to say that uh, Ukraine belongs to the North Atlantic Treaty system, a NATO and the EU. Uh, so they will want that changed, uh, a guarantee of that, a guarantee that uh, Ukraine will not rearm, and a guarantee of, Cri of Russian sovereignty over, over Crimea, that that will not be put into, into jeopardy. Now, now, Putin says this, this intervention, this war on invasion of Ukraine, which he doesn't like the, the word being used, he says it's a, it's a what? military police operation. But it is an invasion, clearly. Um, he says that this is being carried out in order to defend the rights of the Russian-speaking people in uh, Ukraine. And yeah, there has been since 2014 an assault on the rights of uh, Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. And this was what led to, to the uprising in the East. But uh, this is not what Putin is about. This is, he uses for propaganda purposes to, to use great Russian nationalism and so on. But basically what he's defending in Ukraine is the, the general interest of the Russian capitalist class. And the Russian capitalist class is acting in an imperialist uh, way, not as a worldwide imperialist power. They don't have the economic or military might to do that. But yeah, in, in, a, in a regional setting, they, they are acting in an imperialist way in the Caucasus, Central Asia, in the Middle East partially, but also in, in Eastern and Central Europe and the Balkans. They have aspirations of that uh, kind, and this uh, and and this also means, in my opinion, that um, Russia does not want the permanent occupation of Ukraine, which they understand will be very costly, will be faced with uh, armed insurgency or resistance, will be costly in terms of uh, money and also in terms of um, of soldiers uh, uh, being killed and so on. And they are afraid of a, of a scenario developing like that of Afghanistan when the, the Soviet troops went in, 1979, 1980, and they were bogged down in a, in a long-term guerrilla insurgency. So they're not, they're not, they're not prepared to do that. They, they would like to avoid that. What will happen depends on many different factors. But they would like to basically force the Ukrainian government to submission on Russia's terms, and the longer this goes, the, the more stringent will Russia's terms be, and then withdraw, and that's it, and perhaps keep, keep some troops in the Donbass just for safekeeping, and, and that's it. On a more general level, this is a conflict between Russia and the United States, two imperialist powers, the United States being the most powerful of the two, and, uh, and Russia feels, and is not wrong, that uh, Western imperialism took advantage of the collapse of the Soviet Union to advance towards the East. A number of agreement, agreements and commitments were signed back in 1991, and this is all in writing. The documents exist, there's, there's transcripts of them. And these documents said, these um, commitments by the West said that they will not expand NATO to the West further than Germany. And since then, lots of countries have joined uh, NATO in the Balkans, in, the, in Eastern Europe, in the, in the Baltics. And uh, quite rightly, quite rightly, uh, Russia feels, Russian capitalist class feel that this is an aggressive move on, on NATO's part towards them. Now it's very fashionable to say NATO is a defensive alliance. It doesn't threaten anyone. But uh, anyone who knows anything about history, and uh, they know it's, this, is a, this is a threat. And so, um, and so this is the more general context of this situation. And, uh, and Russia now, unlike in 1991 or in 1997, feels strong enough to be able to resist any further encroachment of the West, Western imperialism, into what they consider their own spheres of, uh, of influence. Whether, whether they're right or wrong doesn't enter into this. This is a struggle between two big powers, and they're fighting for, for spheres of influence, markets, um, export of capital, uh, natural resources, and, and so on. And, um, and this is what this is about. And Putin warned the West, said, if you take any further moves in, in relation to this, we will be forced to respond. 
And the, the, the most ironic or, or perhaps the most scandalous thing about all of this is that you could see it coming. I mean, I never thought that Russia was going to invade uh, Ukraine because I thought that by that time, the West, which was not prepared, and they had said so, was not prepared to commit ground troops, would want to reach some accommodation with Russia. But no, instead of that, they, they uh, upped the ante, they, they made more and more belligerent um, statements, which they had no intention of following uh, through. I mean, Biden said in November already, and this is U.S. policy, that uh, Ukraine cannot join NATO in the short term. Biden said Ukrainian democracy has a lot of work to do before they can even consider joining NATO. And it's clear that the European Union countries don't want Ukraine to join. This is going to be revealed now in the next few days when they discuss the, the, application, the application form that Ukraine has sent. So... Will, ha will it have been so difficult for the West, for US imperialism, to put this in writing, to say to Russia, yes, we, we're not thinking about Ukraine joining, at least in the short term. And the other thing that Putin wanted was some, some securities, um, military guarantees in Europe, that there's not going to be NATO military exercises in the border with Russia, which they have been taking place quite regularly. There's not going to be deployment of NATO troops to the border of Russia. And, uh, and also that uh, the U.S. will return to the treaty for non-proliferation of medium-range ballistic missiles, which they left a few years ago unilaterally. This, is, this will have prevented this war. Why could Western imperialism not agree to these terms? Uh, just because the only reason, it seems to me, is that they are the most powerful imperialist power on Earth. And they cannot be seen to be backing down in the face of threats by Russia. This will have weakened their position internationally, and they're not prepared. But therefore, this means that this war was prepared by the West by, by, in order to maintain its prestige, a war that they have no intention of fighting directly, which the Ukrainian people will be massacred over. And um, yes, yeah, so, so that's the, that's the long-term objectives of, uh, of Russia. Russia has been has felt that they, they were on the back foot for 30 years. The U.S. advanced on what they considered the, the Russian capitalists. We're talking here about, not talking about the country in, in abstract, we're talking about the interest of the Russian oligarchs, capitalist class, around uh, whose interest Putin represents. They felt that the West was pushing, pushing and pushing, and then at a certain point they started to, to push back. In Georgia, 2008, in uh, Crimea, 2014, in the Middle East, in, in Syria in 2015, and now with this war in, on, on Ukraine, invasion of Ukraine, they're saying uh, enough is enough. And uh, basically these are two imperialist powers fighting it off uh, for, for spheres of influence, domination of countries and national security, national security of the, of the capitalist class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, and I think you you know very correctly identified that you know the the West and then the Western imperialists are at, at fault for this, and they have created this situation and, and stoked up these uh, the, these tensions uh, consciously. So, uh, and you mentioned uh, twenty fourteen as well, and I'm just um, I'm just curious if you could go more into the events that took place in Ukraine uh, in twenty fourteen and how that basically led to to the situation that we that we have uh, today. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you cannot understand what's happening in Ukraine today without going back, not only to 2014, but perhaps all the way back to, to the collapse of Stalinism in 1991, which was a complete disaster from the point of view of the Ukrainian working people, Ukrainian workers and, and youth, their, their living standards were destroyed. The state property was ransacked by oligarchs, um, helped with armed gangs fighting it amongst each other, Kolomoisky, uh, Poroshenko himself, uh, Ahmetov, and a whole number of other people, basically gangsters, who looted the state property, destroyed the country, took it away, and uh, pocketed it in their own uh, pockets, while the millions of Ukrainians were forced to emigrate to Russia, to Western countries, in order to look for jobs, because there weren't any in, uh, in Ukraine itself. And this, this has been a complete disaster. And uh, for, for all this period of time, for 30 years, there's been a constant struggle with different governments coming to power. 
uh, we had the Orange Revolution in, when was it, 2004, 2005, the coming to power of a pro-Western, pro-liberal, uh, anti-Russian government, which then was uh, reversed in elections subsequently. Then in 2014, we had the opposite happening, the, 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 the overthrow of Yanukovych um by by a gang of of another gang of oligarchs replacement of one gang of oligarchs by another gang of oligarchs but this other new gang that came to power Yatsenyuk, uh abakov um poroshenko they were more pro-western more aligned with the united states people now talk about the, the national sovereignty of ukraine but this in fact since, since 2014 they've had a government whose economic policies are directly direct, dictated by the imf was closely aligned with the United States to the point that the United States Embassy um, decides or has a say in the composition of the of the government, regardless of what the Ukrainian people really think. And the 2014 Euromaidan movement that led to the overthrow of Yanukovych and the arrival of this new new gang to power was uh, a turning point. Was a turning point because um, the neo-Nazi gangs played an important role in the Maidan. That doesn't mean, I mean, the Maidan was a big movement. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the Maidan square at the beginning. But then finally, when, when the final events took place, the ones who led the charge, who played the key role, the ones who were organized and, and armed as well, were the fascist gangs. Svoboda, uh, what then became the Azov Battalion, which at that time was the Social National Assembly of Ukraine, and other fascist and neo-Nazi groups. And they have one thing in common. They, they claim the heritage of Stefan Bandera. And this, this was a Ukrainian reactionary nationalist in the interwar period and in the Second World War, who at one point collaborated with the Nazis and many of these so-called Ukrainian freedom fighters. They went on to form the SS Galicia Division, part of the, of the Nazi troops. They carried out massacres of Polish people, of Jewish people, and so on. And this is the heritage that these people claim. And then subsequently, the government that was formed, the government was not a Nazi government, the Nazis were not in power, but uh, the government that was formed was also following this rhetoric. For instance, they made, uh, there was earlier on even, uh, uh, under the previous government, an attempt to make Stefan Bandera a national hero. Now there is a law that was passed after the Euro Maidan that says the criticism of uh, Ukrainian freedom fighters is banned a criticism of neo-Nazi collaborators is banned. Uh, and, and then they took a number of measures against the Russian language, the downgrading of the Russian language, e even up to 2019, there's another law, a law about language law. And obviously this created a lot of alarm. The national identity of Ukraine is very complex. The, there are some people who take Ukraine, Ukraine to mean these different regimes that were subject to Western imperialism or in, or in this case, German domination in 1918, in 19, uh, during the Second World War and so on. Uh, but then there's a whole massive section of Ukrainian society who reference themselves in the struggle against Nazi Germany in the Second World War, which was fought on Ukrainian territory to great loss by the Red Army. So you can't have in Ukraine a government that claims one side of this so-called heritage uh, this will inevitably lead to the breakup of, of US, uh, sorry, not of Yugoslavia, which was also a reactionary breakup pushed by, by, by Germany, but to the breakup of, um, of Ukraine. And, um, and this is the problem, that this is what the government has been doing in, 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 uh, in Ukraine since 2014. This led, after the Euro Maidan, there was also an anti Maidan movement with big demonstrations, people who felt worried about this, these developments. In, in many places, in, in Kharkiv, in Odessa, in many places, and, the, and there were cl armed clashes between far righters and, 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 and people on the other side. And the people on the other side were a mix of people, people who, who consider themselves communists or who, who claim the legacy of the Soviet Union, uh, the struggle against fascism, the great patriotic war, as, as it was known by, by Stalinism, but also others who were more pro-Russian nationalists, even some who were nostalgics of the of the Russian Empire, which completely reactionary uh, trend, and and these clashes led, for instance, to the massacre of uh, the Odessa massacre 
on May the 2nd, where 40, 50 people were killed in the House of Trade Unions when they were surrounded by Euromaidan uh, protesters, the far right. They were, the building was set on fire and people were not allowed to leave the building and many were, were, were burned to death, including communist militants, Vadim, Padura and others. And this then led to an uprising in the east, in a whole number of, of towns in the Donbass. Um, the people took the official buildings, they basically overran the security forces and they took, they took power, if you want. It was an, 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 a rebellion, an uprising. And the response of the Ukrainian government was to send the army against its own people. And at that time, there were mutinies in the army. Soldiers didn't want to fight. There were, there were big protests and so on. But finally, this kind of solidified in this, this conflict that's been going on for, for what, since 2014 up until, up until now, eight years of conflict. 14,000 people have been killed. No one says anything about this, but there was already a war in, in Ukraine before this invasion. And uh, it wasn't in your BBC news, news bulletins. And there weren't uh, uh, BBC anchors in, in Donetsk reporting daily about the suffering of the people there. This is another case of double standards. But this is really the background to, to this. Of course, Putin uses the plight of the people in Donetsk and Luhansk for cynical reasons. He's not really interested in any of that. He's not interested in the, in the rights of Russian working people in Russia, never mind Russian working people elsewhere. However, this is, this is part of this conflict because uh, otherwise there wouldn't have been an uprising in, in the East and uh, Ukrainian society wouldn't have been so sharply divided. In fact, there's one, one detail just to finish on this point, is that, the, is that the, when Putin made his speech, two weeks ago, where he recognized the independence of the two republics, Donetsk and Luhansk, he said to the Ukrainians, he said, you want decommunistization? So you'll get decommunist because in fact, Ukraine only exists in its current borders because of Lenin and the communists, mm -hmm. which he thought was a bad thing. He wants to go back to the situation of the Russian empire prior to the Russian revolution, where Ukraine was part most of it was part of the Russian Empire. Another part was, was part of other, other countries. And uh, he's not wrong. In fact, some, some uh, Ukrainian comrades that I've I been speaking to for, for uh, going back to the Euro Maidan in, in 2014, they say, ironically, they say Lenin created Ukraine because independent Ukraine has only ever existed uh, at that time. Lenin created Ukraine and now the Ukrainian nationalists have destroyed it. And when it, they, are, they are right, in a sense, this kind of encapsulates the, the, the problem. The policy that Lenin followed in relation to the national question was extremely careful. It he, he, he was a policy of recognizing the right of the Ukrainians and other nations within the Russian Empire to independence. And when the Soviet Union was created formally in, 20, in 1922, a hundred years ago, it was a federation a union of independent republics, including independent Soviet Ukraine, independent Russia, and the Transcaucasian uh, Federation, they all united on equal footing. And there, there is a thing, there, there was a clause in the, UK, in the um, Soviet Union constitution that said that any of the component parts, any of the unions that form part of the Soviet Union, can live at any time if they, if they so wish. This was the only way of uh, uniting Ukraine in its, in its present uh, form, the different tensions and, and national identities that exist uh, there. And the West doesn't care anything about all this. They've been pushing and pushing, and uh, basically they, they are largely responsible for this. And the government in Ukraine is also largely responsible for this situation. Zelensky, Zelensky himself came to power in, in 2019 on the basis of a program of reaching a peace agreement, a settlement with Russia and the republics, uh, i.e. the Minsk II uh, agreements. And then once he, once he was, and fighting the oligarchs. Once he was in power, he became an agent of, of one set of oligarchs and he started pursuing an anti-Russian policy, which is not, not just a policy against your most powerful neighbor, but it's also a policy against a whole section of your own population who, who are Russians and uh, who want, 
don't I mean they, 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 it's not that they are not Ukrainians but they are ethnic Russians and they will like a Ukraine that is at peace and in friendship in one way or another to with with uh, Russia so so yeah I will say that uh, in in reality uh, Putin has invaded um, has invaded Ukraine and this is a reactionary uh, action which can only have reactionary consequences but but uh, behind this whole conflict, is the relentless push of Western imperialism against uh, Russia. And this clash was inevitable. And, uh, and, uh, and the Western imperialists seem to have relished on the prospect of this clash taking place. And uh, even though they're not prepared to participate directly, they just want to use it in one way or another to weaken Russia as much as they as much as they. So yeah, I, th I think these these events have, have, have actually, uh, in a way, sort of exposed um, some of the weaknesses, basically, of, of the Western powers. You know, you've seen uh, uh, Germany uh, playing quite a sort of a vacillating, quite soft role um, with regards to how um, you know Russia should should be approached. Obviously, Germany is quite reliant upon um, you know Russian resources like oil and gas and, and stuff like that. And at the same time, you've had you know the the the, the Tories, uh, you know Boris Johnson and, and Liz Truss. Uh, you know, with all of this bluff and bluster about how we're going to defend Ukraine, um, when actually the, the response, you know, has been pretty weak in terms of actually, uh, you know, um, the prospect of, you know, of sending troops over or anything like that. It seems very clear that the West don't really want to engage uh, too heavily um, further than, you know, sort of sending uh, military aid and such. Um, so, you know, you know, what do you think this sort of, uh, you know, sort of weak response at this stage really shows us about the balance of power uh, on a world stage and particularly the role of the US in, in world relations as well. Yes, th this is very relevant to this, to this situation. The United States is still the dominant imperialist power on earth and therefore the most reactionary force on, on the planet. The military spending is the same or the military might is the same as, as that of the 10 next countries in the top uh, list to put together. So there's no comparison. And even in terms of its economy, now there's a lot of talk about, about uh, whether Chinese GDP is bigger than the US, but obviously Chinese population is much, much bigger than the United States. Productivity of labor is still slower, lower in, in China. So this is the dominant imperialist uh, power. However, uh, some, some, some uh, of the people listening might remember 30 years ago, at the time of the collapse of, of Stalinism, there was all this talk about the unipolar world, a new world order, they said, which they implemented in, uh, in Iraq in 91. New world order means that anyone who steps out of the line will be faced with a massive US military invasion in a coalition of other countries. At that time, Russia and China could do nothing about it. They, they had to abstain in the um, Security Council of the United Nations. And so that invasion was carried out under the banner of the United Nations. There, there, there seemed to be this illusion that uh, there was going to be a, a peace dividend, that one power was going to dominate the world. But that's not so, that's not so much the case. That, that's, that's no longer the case. Because we have seen a relative decline of US imperialism. US imperialism is the dominant power in a world that is much more unstable, in a world dominated, riddled by a capitalist crisis. We've, we've had the big recession of 2007, 2008, now the, the, the one during the pandemic. And this has affected the United States economy itself. There's a massive crisis in the ruling class, which is a reflection of that crisis in the economy. We saw the election of Trump. And all of that, and, and this basically means that uh, the, the United States is, is weaker on the international arena. And there are a number of other powers that are rising. They, they can't yet catch up to, to the United States, but they, they, they're rising and they, they're reasserting their power. They're looking for spheres of influence, markets for the products, markets for the capital and, and, and guaranteeing the supply lines and, and so on, sources of energy like China. Russia, to a lesser extent, I would say that China is, is stronger than, than uh, Russia economically, quite clearly. But uh, and then Russia is a peculiar imperialist country because uh, its economy is, I think it's now the number 11th in the world. It's more or less at the, the GDP of Russia is more or less the same as the GDP of Spain. But in terms of military might, Russia is much, much stronger. 
it inherited the nuclear arsenal from the Soviet uh, Union. And it inherited a high-tech military industry in which they're spending a lot of money. And uh, military might is the consequence of economic uh, might. Uh, the imperialists project the power. The, the power comes from the economy, but it's, it's projected through military might. And so um, the United States is no longer able to control the whole uh, world. And we've seen that even recently. They, For instance, in the, in the Middle East, the war in Syria, they were completely unable to play any role. They've been bogged down for how long? A long time, since, since 2003, in two wars of invasion, imperialist invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, from which they, they found it very difficult to, uh, to leave. And uh, now they've left uh, Afghanistan in, in completely humiliating conditions. They announced that they were leaving. And immediately the, the government, the puppet government they left in was completely overrun by the, by the Taliban reactionary force. But in, in any case, they, they could claim that at the end of the day, they defeated US imperialism, which is a phenomenal thing. When, uh, as I said, when, when, um, when the war in Syria, the United States has strategic interests in the Middle East and they could do nothing, nothing because they couldn't, they wouldn't, they were unable to commit ground troops. And so, therefore, who was the, the deal breaker, the, the, the deal maker in, in this war in Syria was Russia, which dealt with uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the reactionary fundamentalists, the FSA, and, and settled the whole matter. The Kurds settled the whole matter. And uh, then we had other things like, um, like the situation in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is a country where, where the imperialists have big investments in oil and other things. And who settled the matter when the people rose up? It wasn't the United States, it was Russia, sent the army in. The war between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, which was mostly triggered or, or promoted by Turkey for their own reasons. Who broke the peace deal? Russia. And who sent the peacekeepers? Russia. Uh, the United States was nowhere to be seen. They had enough dealing with their own political crisis at, at home. So this all reveals the relative decline of U.S. imperialism. And I think that that's perhaps one of the reasons why U.S. imperialism was so keen for this war to go ahead and for Russia to become bogged down in, in a situation that's going to be difficult for them. That's what they expect. Uh, just to reassert their own power uh, and just as a revealing their own insecurities. And then there's this other thing that you mentioned, which is very correct and is very visible, the, the splits, the divisions between the U.S., and its uh, European allies, which have different uh, interests. There has been a rift for some time between uh, Berlin and Washington, but now um, this question of sanctions, which, which they were introduced yesterday, it's very easy for the United States to say we're going to ban Russian oil. They only, they only rely 5% of the oil they import is from Russia. And they now, incidentally, ironically, they now are uh, going to get some of that from Venezuela, uh, where, where they don't even recognize the government. Now, they, all of a sudden, they recognize the government. They ditched this idiot Guaido that they recognized previously. And now, and now this regime that was supposed to be undemocratic, they couldn't talk to them and uh, illegitimate. Now, now they're talking to them for oil. So that's, that's, the, that's the cynicism of, of imperialism. But anyway. It's very easy for, or relatively easy for the United States to ban imports of Russian oil. But uh, Germany, as you said, depends 60% on imports of uh, Russian gas. They can't do it. They, they, they can't do it in one year. They can never, mi never mind doing it in, in a few weeks, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, this is the, the logic of, uh, of capital flows in a globalized world, that they all depend on each other. Not only this, but, uh, but Russia is the first producer of, of a number of important minerals, nickel, uh, but above all pal palladium, I think, and then rare earths together with China. But uh, they, they are a big power in relation to export of uh, energy sources and raw materials and all of that. And in fact, if Russia does what it's threatened to do, if, if they start um, attacking Russia economically and Russia retaliates, the ones who are going to lose out is the Europeans. For this reason, European capitalists, for this reason, Macron 
and, uh, and Scholz, the, the chancellor in Germany, had a completely different position prior to the war. They, they, they were more in favor of negotiations or a diplomatic arrangement because they, they have most to lose from, from a war. At the end, what's happening in reality is that this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is creating massive economic uh, problems. And who's going to pay for these economic problems? Well, you and me in, in our energy bills, which were already very high. They're now going up higher even. But yeah, basically, this, these two factors are very important and they are relatively new. One, the relative decline of US imperialism. Second, the splits between US imperialism and its European uh, allies. And, and I think that Russia has taken advantage of this or attempted to take advantage of this in saying enough is enough and, uh, and, uh, and making a stance over this question of Ukraine. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned uh, sanctions, and sanctions definitely seem to be the sort of the preferred uh, weapon in the in the arsenal of, uh, of 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 the imperialists at the minute. Um, and we've seen, you know, also, uh, you know, uh, you know, private companies, companies like uh, like McDonald's, have withdrew all of their sort of uh, services from from Russia. But also, yeah, um, you know, Mastercard, uh, Visa, Google Pay, and so on, have, have all sort of uh, restricted or indeed actually just halted their services altogether. Um, uh, in 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 Russia, uh, you know, what what effect do you think that these these sanctions are going to have? Are they going to be effective in terms of achieving the objectives of of, of the Western imperialists? Uh, yeah, what what effect are they going to have in, in Russia? Uh, and indeed, what what are all these sort of uh, you know economic measures and this general economic dislocation going to have on on the, on the world economy in general? I mean, you mentioned the the, the price rises, um, which indeed will be compounded with already existing inflation. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested in hearing uh, you know briefly your your, your views on that. Yes, yeah, sanctions will not stop Russia's war in, in Ukraine at all, not at all. Uh, and they've never, they've never worked anywhere. I mean, there's been US blockade of Cuba for 60 years. They haven't achieved anything. There's been uh, US uh, sanctions on Venezuelan oil since 2019 and other sanctions since 2015 they haven't achieved any, anything or any of, the, of their st stated aims regime change they have the, the sanctions on iran haven't prevented iran from developing a nuclear program the, these sanctions they don't work um, particularly in the case of russia because russia had already discounted the impact of the sanctions the west had announced the sanctions this is going to be the biggest sanctions ever. They're going to hurt and blah, blah. So obviously the, the Russian uh, state and the capitalists had already taken certain measures to kind of insulate themselves as much as possible from these sanctions. They built up the reserves of the central bank and so on. Now, these sanctions will have an impact on, on the economy. And who's going to pay for this? Not the oligarchs, uh, but ordinary working people in Russia. They're going to suffer from these sanctions in the same way that the sanctions on sanctions on Iraq for most of the 1990s were, were paid by the Iraqi people. 500, half a million people died directly as a result of these sanctions. Did they, did they prevent Saddam Hussein from holding on to power and repressing it, the, his own people? No, not at all. So that gives you an idea of what's going to happen with these uh, sanctions. The other thing is that the West is also very cynical with, with sanctions, of course. During these negotiations for sanctions, for instance, Italy got an exemption uh, so that they could continue to export luxury handbags made in um, the high fashion firms in, in uh, Milan to Russia, because there's a big market for, for that. The Russian oligarchs like it. So they're very cynical in this respect. In London, which is a place, London, Surrey, all these places where the London, uh, where the, the, the Russian capitalists have their money stashed in property and so on, these sanctions in Britain are only going to take effect in in a month's time or in six months' time. By which time the, the Russian oligarchs will have already changed the property deeds of the of the houses and mansions, or they will have sold 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 them out to other people and, and cashed in the money. Uh, most of these oligarchs, incidentally, are donors of the of the funders of the Tory party, so they, they won't, don't want to upset them too much. M most of these things are for show, but the things, the sanctions that really have an impact, economic impact, will also backfire on on Western imperialism because it will have a knock-on effect on on them. For instance, Britain said, "We're not going to buy any more Russian oil. Where are you going to buy the oil from uh, and gas?" Britain is not very dependent or not as dependent as European 
or the European countries, but still bringing gas in tankers from the United States is much more expensive than, than gas from, from, Europe via, from Russia via Europe. So who's going to pay for this? I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be the consumers in the, in the West. McDonald's has ceased to operate in, in uh, Moscow. Well, uh, they're so lucky they're going to have a, a, more, a better diet, I'd say. This doesn't really have a big uh, impact. And the sanctions that do have an impact are going to be paid by working, uh, by working people over there in Russia and over here as well, because these sanctions come at a time when, when the, the world economy was in a very fragile state, coming out of the pandemic, more or less, um, already threatened by high inflation, a slow growth. Um, according to some calculations, these uh, sanctions, the, imp the knock-on effect of sanctions on the world economy are going to knock, knock out, I don't know, 1%, 2% of growth in the world economy in 2023 and 2024. That is for two years to come at a time when the world economy was growing at a very sluggish pace. And the other effect that they will have, which is bad for Western imperialism, is they're going to push Russia further into the arms of China. There are already deals to ease off the, the impact of sanctions, the deals that were signed during the Olympics in, in uh, Beijing, the Winter Olympics. Um, but this is going to be the, the effect. If they, if they wanted somehow to separate Russia from China, they, they achieved the opposite, uh, the opposite effect, of course. And some of these sanctions will then gonna be lift, are going to be lifted once the war is over and the war will, will end at some point. But some others will have a more permanent effect of, of uh, pushing the Russian economy more uh, into direct links with the Chinese uh, uh, economy. But the most dangerous thing about all this is that this could be the trigger, not the cause, but the trigger for another worldwide recession of capitalism uh, when we have just barely come out of the previous uh, one. And, and this is going to be really bad for working people everywhere. Yeah, so you've uh, outlined the, the, the situation and the knock-on effects that this is going to have. Uh, I guess I'd like to move on to the, the final question uh, here, um, you know, which is, you know, how should we, uh, as Marxists, as, as socialists, as revolutionaries, uh, respond to these events? Uh, and, and, you know, what, what is the, the solution, really? What, what, what are the demands that we can put forward? And what is the fundamental solution to, uh, you know, the, the horrors of, of, of war and, and, and conflict and, and, and capitalism and uh, national oppression? Uh, is there an answer to this? And how can we actually achieve a lasting uh, peace? I will say that uh, a good starting point is the slogan that Karl Liebknecht raised at the time of the First World War, when he, when he said the first, the, f the first enemy of the working class is at home, i.e. our own ruling class. And this applies to this conflict. Of course, we oppose uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine because it's, it's, uh, it's done, not for any progressive reasons, but for, for reasons of imperialist uh, ambitions of uh, Russia and the defense of Russia's capitalists' national interest and, and national security. There's nothing progressive in, in that. The first task of the Russian Marxists, Russian working class activists, is to oppose Putin. And our comrades of the international Marxist tendency in Russia have done so. And many of them have been arrested in this. Uh, they, they, they took a very clear position of opposition to this uh, war. And many of them were arrested. Some of them are in jail. Some of them been fined and so on. But for us here in the West, our main task is to oppose our, our imperialist class. Our main enemy is also at home. Our main enemy is not Putin. Our main enemy is uh, Boris Johnson, uh, NATO, and US imperialism. We should be clear about, about this. And our main task is to denounce the hypocrisy of, of them and to denounce this mad dash for rearmament uh, and spend more military spending that they using the excuse of this war in order to pass through our parliaments in Germany, in Britain, everywhere. So, so there's no money. They, they, we are in an economic crisis. There's no money for the health service. There's no money for, for proper sick pay. There's no money for education. But however, they very quickly find money when it's a question of spending in, uh, in uh, weapons. And uh, this is a complete scandal. And this should be our main position. Uh, which is precisely the opposite of the position that's been taken by Starmer, uh, the leader of the British Labour Party. His main position is any criticism of NATO at this time 
is a casus belli, is, is a reason for expulsion. Any, any MP, member of parliament, who, who criticizes NATO will be expelled from the parliamentary level. This is a complete scandal. And it's ba basically the same position that the big majority of the social democracy took during the, during the First World War, basically voting for the war credits. In fact, if you think about it, Starmer is more belligerent in favor of NATO than even Boris Johnson is, is trying to criticize Boris Johnson from the right. Uh, which is a complete uh, scandal. So it's clear our main, main task, I would say the main slogan of the British Marxist, Marxist in Britain or in the United States is, is down with NATO, disband NATO, uh, US troops and bases out of Europe. And, uh, and we have to fight our own imperialist uh, powers who are also responsible for this uh, war. While at the same time, of course, offering solidarity to the working people of Russia, the working people of Ukraine, and so on. But the best way we can do that is fighting our own uh, uh, imperialists. So, so this will be our first, uh, our first duty. The second, second point that should be noted is that there are others on the left who have uh, a position of, say, we fight for peace, we fight against this war, and uh, we should go back to diplomacy, the respect for international law, the United Nations, we also have to say that this is a very weak position, which, which, which um, reflects lack of understanding of the real functioning of, of imperialism. The United Nations are an empty talking shop. Uh, they just passed a resolution demanding uh, Russian withdrawal from, uh, from Ukraine. And what's happened? Nothing has happened. Uh, in the same way that the United Nations passed a resolution every single year for the last 20, 30 years, demanding the end of the US blockade of Cuba. And nothing's happened. And incidentally, you know which countries voted against last year when it was voted? The, the, it was Israel and the United States voted against. And then two countries abstained. Far right Brazil of Bolsonaro and, and Ukraine. The Ukrainian government abstained on, on uh, that. I supported uh, supported the United States. The, the United Nations has passed many resolutions in support of the Palestinians against the, the oppression of the Palestinians by the Israeli state. And nothing has happened about this. The world, world relations are not dominated by any inter so-called international law or commonly agreed rules. They are dominated by the rule of the strongest, the, the mightiest powers carry the day. And they do so if they can through, through negotiations and deals. And if they cannot, they do so through wars, either direct wars or proxy wars. This is how the world works. And if you want peace, if you want peace, which is we all want peace, we, we, want, we don't want a wall of war where people have to flee their homes because they're being bombed and leave their, their, their possessions and just uh, start on, a, on, an, on an unknown, to, towards an unknown destiny some, somewhere else. No, we don't want uh, that uh, human uh, suffering. However, if you really want peace, you have to fight for socialism. You have to fight, to, you have to understand what is the cause of war. The cause of war is capitalism, and particularly in its imperialist uh, phase. The, the, the struggle for resources, uh, markets, and the conflicts for, for spheres of influence, this is what causes war. And therefore, if we want to fight war, we need to put an end to imperialism. There, there's no other way uh, uh, around this. And, and, and also, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have double, double standards. We are against war. We are against all wars, not just the wars that are, that are conducted by our enemy imperialist uh, power, but mainly the wars that are carried out by our own uh, imperialist power. So this is I, what I will say. Uh, the program of the Marxists should start from this slogan, the main enemy of the working class, the, the first enemy of the working class is at home. Therefore, we should fight our own imperialist uh, powers. We should also, in my opinion, fight any illusions, any pacifist uh, illusions. The real way to achieve peace is to put an end to imperialism, to imperialism and uh, therefore to struggle for, for socialism. Once the workers come to power in one country after another, there will be no reason for, for war. And, and this still uh, leaves one question. What, what should we say to the Ukrainian uh, working uh, people? Well, our solidarity goes to them quite clearly. 
but uh, at the same time we need to understand what are the causes of this uh, of this war the 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 friends are not nato or western imperialism who egged on egg, egg their leaders on to this uh, war and then abandoned them but rather the 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 true friends are first of all the workers of of ukraine which will be united across language and national uh, divide against their own uh, oligarchs who plunge them into this war and the destruction of the last 30 years and uh, united with the Russian workers who uh, have nothing to gain by oppressing the Ukrainian uh, workers and they have the interest and not in common with the interest of the Russian imperialist ruling class and uh, only on this basis as it was proven in 1922 can uh, Ukraine have an independent uh, existence based on working class fraternity and, uh, and brotherhood across national and, and linguistic uh, divides. And, uh, and that will be a big contribution to a world socialist uh, federation. There's no reason in the 21st century why there should be war, um, hunger, misery, millions of people having to flee their countries because of war, conflicts or, or poverty or starvation. And um, th there's no reason why millions of people have had no access to COVID vaccinations. Uh, hundreds of thousands have died unnecessarily from this uh, pandemic because the capitalist governments put profits before people's needs. There's no reason for any of this. The only reason why these things still exist, war, poverty, hunger, misery and, and conflict is because of the continued existence of the capitalist uh, system, a, capital, a system that is completely rotten and should be swept from the, from the face of the earth. The sooner, the better. Yeah, I totally agree with what you just said there. I think, uh, you know, it's absolutely necessary that we, you know, um, fight against, uh, you know, capitalism and, and, and imperialism to put an end to this uh, this horror. And I think to do so, you know, we need a revolutionary uh, leadership that's capable of, of cutting through the lies of the of the of, of the bourgeois press and, and capable of exposing the hypocrisy of the uh, the imperialists and their lackeys in the labor movement as well. And above all, we need a leadership that is capable of leading the masses to victory in the struggle against capitalism. Um, so yeah, I, I would urge all of those who are listening today um, to get involved with the Socialist Appeal uh, and the international Marxist tendency. And uh, yeah, you can find out more about how to do that using the link uh, in the show notes of this podcast. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank you for coming on the podcast, uh, Jorge. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and I hope to have you on again soon. Yeah, sure. It was a pleasure for me. And uh, yeah, I would like to echo your, your call. All, uh, all who listen to this, to this podcast should, should uh, have a look at marxist.com, socialist.net, find out what our ideas are, and war puts all tendencies to the test, and uh, find out what our position is, compare it to the, other position, the positions of other tendencies in the workers' uh, movement, and if you agree with us, if you want to help us in this struggle to put an end to capitalism, join us. So that's it for this week's episode of Marxist Voice. If you'd like to learn more about the situation in Ukraine as the events unfold, head to www.marxist.com for regular news and analysis from a Marxist perspective. And if you'd like to learn more about how Marxists approach the question of war and imperialism, head to the Education Hub on our website at www.socialist.net forward slash education. There you can find various texts, books and talks on, on various aspects of this vital question. And make sure you stay tuned for next week's episode where we'll be releasing part two of our series on women's liberation on the topic of the origins of women's oppression. Hope you all have a revolutionary week. I've been your host, Jack Ty Wilson, and you've been listening to Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal.